ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on a what appears to be a spring-like night out, which is a nice change from the Melbourne <coughs> cold. Um, I'm John Tobin, um, Melbourne Face, which is nice to see. I'm the co-director with my colleague Professor Billy Charles up the back there um, of the Human Rights Program at Melbourne Law School. On behalf of Melbourne Law School, I'm delighted to be on here tonight, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation from Professor Philip Olsen. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we spend today on the traditional land of the Wurundjeri people, and acknowledge their elders past and present. A few housekeeping matters to begin with. Um, we are being recorded, so if you can please turn up your mobile phones. Um, the recording will be a lot available, I think, next week, and we'll email you to advise you when and where to receive that. Um, can I also thank our events team? So I think uh, in the audience here, Amelia Cottingham and Dorothy Luck for organising tonight's proceedings. Thank you very much. This evening's presentation is actually co-sponsored with my colleague Hugh de Kretzer, who is Executive Director of the Human Rights Law Centre. Many of you will know the centre. It's the preeminent human rights NGO in Australia. It has an extraordinary impact in the work it does, raising awareness of human rights. I think a total of 15,000 people, according to the website, have been educated by the centre. They've also achieved outstanding success in areas around prisoners' rights, right to health and other related issues. It's a delight for me to be working closely with the centre and they would collaborate this, this evening's event. And to our speaker, many of you will know Professor Alston. Alston. He has appeared here now, I think, the last four years annually giving a lecture. <laughs> oh, He's dear. currently teaching in our graduate program. We've asked him yet again to come out tonight to speak to us again. Um, he's a former Melbourne Law School student from another period, back in the 70s, I think. Um, I was last entry as well, so we can't make that joke anymore. He's currently also the co-director of the Centre for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU. Phil has earned himself a reputation, I think, as one of the most, I suppose, esteemed and effective academics and practitioners in the human rights sphere today. Um, I saw the phrase today, um, um, uh, am amphibic, uh, what's it? Uh, reptile-like the way people go at their work, and amphibian, is that a word? I think it is. Amphibian. Amph that's the word. Um, transgressive, moving from both um, practice to research in the way that many others can't do as well. He's occupied many roles, and it's a positive thing, I should say, as well. He's occupied many roles within the UN system, um, former chair of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, rapporteur on extrajudicial killings and arbitrary executions, and currently his role is on extreme poverty and human rights. A role that is invigorated in ways of, I suppose, earned him a reputation as a fearless and strong advocate for human rights in the context of poverty. And so tonight, please join me in welcoming Philip to the stage again to present the topic <coughs> speaking towards dystopia, social policy in the United States of America and Australia. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks very much, John. Uh, I've never been called reptilian before in an, <laughs> in an introduction, but um, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, many of the governments with which I've had dealings would certainly endorse your <laughs> sentiments on that. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in, uh, back in Melbourne. Uh, while the law school is certainly a big draw card, uh, an even bigger one is one of my daughters who are here uh, and the other one who's not and is about to produce uh, a second child any minute. Um, so it's lovely to be here. Um, I should, of course, begin by commiserating with all of you um, now that Melbourne is no longer the world's most livable city. <laughs> You've been overtaken by Vienna, I think it was, um, but uh, nonetheless, I'm sure you're coping. Um, I, uh, and thanks very much to my old friend and colleague, John Tobin, for his, uh, his kind words. Um, I'm going to uh, speak tonight based on the um, recent mission that I undertook to the United States uh, in my capacity as UN Special Rapporteur. Uh, I spent a couple of weeks touring around the US, um, nominally at the invitation of the American government. Um, it follows on from visits that I've paid to various other countries around the world, uh, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, Romania, Chile, um, Mauritania uh, and others to look at these specific issues of the relationship between poverty and human rights. But the United States was, of course, a particularly important uh, country. Uh, it continues to be uh, a leader in a great many respects, uh, whether we like that or not. 
Uh, the reality is that many policies have originated in the United States and are subsequently exported to other countries. And it's no different when it comes to uh, issues of human rights and poverty. Uh, the United States has long been at the forefront of rejecting the notion of economic, social and cultural rights insisting that these are not rights that should be treated uh, on a par with, quote, real human rights. Uh, they've taken a very active role in the United Nations and elsewhere in opposing efforts to recognize and implement uh, those rights. And when it comes to welfare policy, of course, the United States has its own very specific way of approaching those issues. Um, what I want to suggest tonight is that while Australia is a very different society uh, to the United States and while there are still many really fundamental differences between us and them, there are areas in which I see uh, a degree of deeply problematic uh, convergence and I think there are therefore important lessons that Australians can learn from having a better understanding of the relationship in the United States between poverty and its impact, or between poverty and rights enjoyment. But I'll explain that more uh, in a moment. Um, first of all, just some context. Um, the role of a special rapporteur, so-called. It's an odd word, odd term. Um, <clears throat> I sometimes think that it has uh, persisted because people have no idea what it really is and therefore it sounds good, uh, so why not stay with it? Um, it really translates simply into being a, an independent expert who's appointed by the UN, the Human Rights Council in particular, but then has the ability to speak freely and independently on the issue of his or her alleged expertise. Um, the reality is that I am portrayed as representing the UN, and if you look at the very extensive media coverage in the US of the report that I did, it's always the UN report. Uh, it's not Alston's report, it's not the independent experts report, uh, but there is this um, interesting and nuanced difference between the fact that I'm not actually a UN official, but nonetheless am uh, treated as though I am and presented in that way. Um, I made an effort to be as comprehensive as I could in the space of two weeks. The US, like Australia, is a very big country. Uh, I ended up traveling from uh, California all the way across to Puerto Rico and the Caribbean uh, and stopping off on a number of, in a number of places on the way. Uh, the experiences were fairly uh, dramatic. Uh, what I do is, of course, to meet with a lot of government officials in different places, but also to go out to poor areas and to talk with people uh, on the streets, uh, people who are uh, barely managing to survive in full-time employment and a range of others in order to get a sense of what's really going on. Um, I met with a lot of people on Skid Row in Los Angeles, um, hundreds, thousands probably, uh, living in uh, tents in the streets extremely close to the central business district. Uh, closer than this to uh, Melbourne's CBD uh, is Skid Row. Um, I went to San Francisco also to look at homelessness and uh, listened as a police officer told a group of homeless people to move on. Uh, and when they said, okay, but where to? He said, I don't know, just move on. And of course that was the way of dealing with it, simply moving them on until the policeman finished his beat and they could settle back down somewhere. Um, I went to various places, both in California, um, West Virginia and elsewhere, where I heard about 
a practice that I'll tell you about shortly uh, of actually raising money for government purposes off the backs of the poor by rather artificially imposing fines and fees upon them, a practice which is increasingly common. Uh, I went to Alabama, uh, close to Montgomery, a place called Lowndes County, which is one of the poorest in the so-called Black Belt, uh, and saw lots of raw sewage uh, spilling out into back gardens in areas which have not been provided with any sewerage facilities by the uh, authorities. Uh, the principal reason being that these were essentially black neighborhoods uh, and the extremely nearby white neighborhoods were all very well uh, catered for. Um, I saw people, and this seems rather strange in a way, to focus on this, uh, who had lost all of their teeth uh, because dental care is simply not covered by the majority of programs available to the poor in the United States. Uh, and I learned, um, it wasn't the first time, but it was dramatic to actually speak to people, what the consequences are of not having access to dental care. Uh, the pain, uh, the bad smell that comes from one's mouth, uh, the unemployability that follows from that. Uh, and once you finally have an emergency, you might be able to go to an emergency room and they might pull out teeth, but they will not provide you with any alternatives uh, or fill them. Um, I heard about the greatly um, increasing death rates due to opioid abuses in middle America. Uh, about which the government has done all too little uh, in recent years. Uh, and I met with people in Puerto Rico, which would be the poorest state in the Union, if it were a state, um, who were living under huge uh, piles of coal ash, mountains of coal ash. In fact, you know, you'd look up and it's a bit like this building from outside was coal ash, but there were neighborhoods all around and there were no environmental uh, provisions to prevent uh, that coal ash from simply blowing all around the neighborhood and uh, basically bringing illness and uh, disability and eventually death to a lot of the people living in those areas. Um, I should say that there were some positive experiences in terms of the role that civil society plays in order to step in. <laughs> Uh, to help. That was very impressive. I went to a church that really moved me in San Francisco where they opened their doors every day to the homeless. Uh, not at night and not when masses were being celebrated, but for the rest of the time the pews were basically occupied by homeless people. Um, and they had really organized it in such a way they employed homeless to keep order, uh, they, the homeless sort of organized themselves and this church was just dedicated to uh, providing the sort of facilities that are not available anywhere else to these people. And in both LA and San Francisco, homelessness is a, a huge problem uh, with very little being done to, uh, <clears throat> to address it. But I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, the, the bottom line of my report, let me read very quickly uh, what I said. The United States is a land of stark contrasts. It's one of the world's wealthiest societies, a global leader in many areas, and a land of unsurpassed technological and other forms of innovation. Its corporations are global trendsetters. Its civil society is vibrant and sophisticated and its higher education system leads the world, apart from Melbourne. <laughs> but its immense wealth and expertise stands in shocking contrast with the conditions in which vast numbers of its citizens live. About 40 million Americans live in poverty, 18 and a half million in what's classified by the United States itself as extreme poverty, and 5.3 million 
live in what the Nobel economist Angus Deaton called third world conditions of absolute poverty. It has the highest youth poverty rate in the OECD, the highest infant mortality rates among comparable OECD states. Its citizens live shorter and sicker lives compared to those living in all other rich democracies. Eradicable tropical diseases are increasingly prevalent. It has the world's highest incarceration rate. And in fact, just after I left, or just after my visit finished, the World Health Organization announced that China had actually surpassed the United States in the number of healthy years that a baby born today will live based on current statistics, which is pretty shocking when you compare the wealth per capita of the two societies. Uh, but whereas China, for all of its problems, and I'm certainly not here to defend the Chinese political system, nonetheless has a genuine commitment to poverty elimination and thus to improving the basic material conditions of life of all of its citizens. That, of course, is very far from the uh, policy approach adopted in the United States. Some specific examples, briefly. Uh, homelessness was an issue of particular interest uh, in some ways, um, particularly uh, problematic in California, but not only. Uh, I know uh, it's also an issue in New York. Um, my family and I have been uh, living out of New York for some time now, and my uh, two uh, younger children returned home last night in New York. <clears throat> uh, one of them is 14 and the other one is 12. And on the telephone this morning, the report that I got was from a, a very unempathetic son saying, Dad, it's just terrible. They've erected scaffolding around our building and that has brought in loads of homeless people. So they're just all over the sidewalk uh, and it's really awful here. Um, I would have liked a little more empathy and I will no doubt deliver in due course a talk on um, how the problem is not with the homeless but with the system that generates them and doesn't provide better alternatives for them. Um, but it's a problem throughout the United States. So what's being done um, in uh, Los Angeles, for instance, uh, in Skid Row, there were roughly a bit under 2,000 homeless people. Until a few months before my visit, they had nine toilets for those 2,000 people. So what do you do when you've got virtually no toilets? You can guess. However, public urination is a crime and you'll be arrested for it. And you'll be pleased to hear that while arrests in LA um, in the last few years decreased by 15%, the number of homeless people arrested increased by 31%. And a lot of those are for sleeping on the street, urinating in the street, or whatever. There's nowhere else to pee, I'm sorry. There's no public toilets. That's what a human does. Um, but the criminalization is really um, a perfect illustration because what happens is that uh, they are, and I was told about this in great detail, the police come by, uh, you are uh, sitting on the sidewalk next to your shopping trolley, uh, which has your life's possessions in it. The police say, right, peeing on the sidewalk, that's I think $120 or whatever, here's your fine. Of course, they don't have $120, so they don't pay the fine. 
uh, at a certain point, the police come by and say, right, um, you now have to go to court. You've been summoned. They don't go to court because there's nowhere to leave their trolley. If the um, council finds the trolley, it is trashed. Uh, it's taken to the dump, and so all of their belongings are disposed of. Um, they are then convicted uh, of a felony because they have failed to pay a fine that has grown significantly uh, for non-payment. Uh, they are put in prison. And then, of course, when they come out, they then have the additional benefit of a criminal record, which makes it absolutely impossible for them to get housing. In many states in America, once you've got a criminal record, you're not eligible for public housing. Uh, your family can even be thrown out uh, if you are imprisoned for drug use or something like that. Um, and so the circle, the cycle of homelessness just gets ever worse. Um, one of the findings that I made, which is um, very strong and was not appreciated, um, is that the way in which the poor are treated is in fact helping to undermine democracy in the United States. Um, in, <clears throat> in the US there is a law in many states that if you have been convicted of a felony, you lose the vote forever, even once you're released. And so there are six million citizens who cannot vote for that reason. Overwhelmingly, of course, they are black um, because those are the ones who are charged with the sort of crimes and who can't get decent defense um, and end up losing their votes. Similarly, once they are released, unless they can pay all of their outstanding fines and fees, uh, they don't get the vote back. And so in a state like Alabama, the majority of all people who have actually been to prison uh, for felonies cannot vote. Then there's what is called, what I call covert disenfranchisement, um, which includes dramatic gerrymandering. You may have read about that. Uh, so that votes are rendered uh, useless for many citizens. Uh, the imposition of artificial and unnecessary voter identification requirements. Uh, the manipulation of where polling stations are located. Um, very few polling stations in areas where poor people live. Long queues discouraging them from staying around. Um, the relocation of departments of motor vehicles away from poor areas because they are the ones who issue the ID which you need to be able to vote. Um, and there was a headline in the New York Times uh, yesterday or today, <clears throat> I haven't bothered to read the story because I know what it's all about, saying that what's interesting is that the Justice Department under President Trump has reversed all of its previous policies which were designed to challenge these different forms of voter disenfranchisement. And it's now supporting all of these initiatives, which are largely pushed by Republican groups in a very determined effort uh, to cut down uh, the uh, ability of poor people to vote. What I want to talk about, though, which uh, I argue is relevant uh, in the Australian context in which we are seeing are two things in particular. First, what I call the war on the poor. This is a way of trying to justify a movement away from any form of comprehensive societal social welfare provision uh, to a system where every person is on their own. And there are a number of ways in which that is done, um, designed of course to 
either dehumanize the poor or portray them as totally undeserving. Um, the first is a general narrative, which I think we hear every bit as much in Australia, about the comparative characteristics of the rich and the poor. Uh, the poor are wasters, losers, scammers, and money spent on them is money down the drain. The rich, on the other hand, are industrious, entrepreneurial, patriotic, and the drivers of economic success. This is a very standard narrative, um, and I'd be happy to talk about the reality, which I see as being rather different. Second, the poor are usually black, at least if you look at any of the photographs that depict the problem of poverty in the American media. In fact, it's not the case. There are eight million more poor whites than there are blacks. But by racializing the issue, it's another way of dividing the community, of driving that wedge, uh, of saying that it's those lazy black people who want welfare, and we whites are not going to put up with that. Uh, this is barely beneath the surface in much of the discourse in the United States. There's then the fraud narrative. I sometimes forget which language I'm trying to speak, whether it's American or Australian. Uh, doll bludger is our term, isn't it? I think. Um, so I met with various officials in the administration and I was regaled with these tales of people they had found uh, spending all day watching cable TV when they weren't on their iPhones doing social media and these people are on welfare and this is why we need to crack down, this is why we've got to cut uh, dramatically um, to avoid uh, that sort of uh, problem. The difficulty was that I then said to administration representatives, can you give me statistics? Have you actually tracked down the number of people who are fraudulently claiming benefits? Because of course there's fraud. There's fraud fraud everywhere. Um, one of the amazing comparisons, I have to say, is that the Trump administration is busily increasing the numbers of people who are trying to root out fraud in the welfare system, while the Republicans have spent the whole of the last decade or so undermining the Internal Revenue Service the tax office. So the numbers of employees in the tax office have dropped dramatically. The tax office is simply not able to investigate anything like the range of allegations of fraud uh, that take place. So you've got this uh, dramatic contrast. When I asked for the figures on welfare fraud, they didn't give me anything. And so I went to the public record and the best I could find was what they call an error rate for improper payments. But that covers more than just fraud. It's they could make mistakes or whatever. And the error rate for food stamps was 3.6%. For public housing, it was 4%. And for travel claim payments by the Defence Department, it was 8%. And the administration, despite constantly saying we need to cut down on this, did not have statistics to show that it's a serious problem. Next, and here again, there is a very direct parallel, I believe, with Australia. The Trump administration has come up with one single welfare policy. That's it. And that is, we believe in work, not welfare. And these people should get out 
and get jobs. And so they are busily implementing uh, really draconian work or voluntary service requirements up to 30 hours a week uh, for people to continue to get things like food stamps, uh, housing subsidies, uh, and even in some states, Medicare, in other words, access to minimum health for the poorest. They have to show that they are working those sort of hours. Now, the problem is that when you again look at the statistics, the Kaiser Foundation is the best known in the US which does this. What they say is that, first of all, a majority of people on food stamps and Medicare and so on are indeed already working. That if you then take the number who are either in school or are full-time caring for others, caring for a parent, caring for a disabled child or whatever, you're left with a percentage of about eight who are not working. And of those 8%, of course, you're going to find a lot with mental problems of one kind or another uh, and other reasons why they're not able to. I'm not suggesting for a moment that there are not a lot of scammers out there, that there aren't people who are very fit uh, and able but are on welfare. But the percentage of those remains very small and the government, again, does not have statistics to bear out this emphasis that the reason why we need to cut all of the benefits is because these people could actually be out working. The second, and I'll come back in a minute, I better move on. The second big area, and I think this is the one that is most pertinent to um, Australia and the current debate, uh, is what I call fiscal policy. Here, you start with the fact that the United States already has the highest rate of income inequality among all Western countries. You then add the $1.5 trillion of tax cuts that were passed by Congress in the very week that I was in Washington DC in December of last year. Article in the New York Times yesterday looking at the impact of the tax cuts. Now, I'm not suggesting that the New York Times is other than a left-wing newspaper by American standards, uh, but I think they remain fact and evidence-based in their assessments. They're looking at the impact of the latest tax cuts, and what they say is, so far, the most dramatic impact has simply been corporate buybacks expected to reach a trillion dollars this year. In other words, with the uh, reduced tax rates on corporations, the resulting windfall has been used to make uh, the management and, of course, the stockholders much richer. It has not been used uh, to stimulate the economy. It has not been used to increase wages Indeed, wages remain stagnant despite full employment uh, in the United States. Uh, and when you say, yes, but surely the tax cuts will benefit everyone, as the administration says, again, the figures are that if you're low income, $25,000, you will pay $60 less. If you're um, earning, if you're in the top 1% of income earners, your tax uh, windfall will be over $50,000 uh, a year. So that's the proportion in which the tax cuts are going to the wealthy versus the, those uh, who might be considered poor. But what you need to know is that in the United States, this tax cut is just the latest of a long series of um, policies adopted under the rubric of the taxpayers' revolt, which began back in the 1970s with what was called Proposition 13 in California in 1978. Uh, Proposition 13 um, 
amended the state constitution to reduce property taxes. Property taxes are the ones that pay for all local community stuff, education, uh, etc. Um, and to require a two-thirds vote of the legislature to increase state taxes. So when I was in Alabama, for example, I said, um, what are you doing about the resurgence of tropical diseases? And the answer, and I asked similar questions in West Virginia where health conditions are absolutely abysmal. And the answer from the health authorities was really very matter of fact. It is, well, <laughs> we don't have any money and we cannot raise taxes. The legislature will not raise taxes. That's the big promise by the governor. We don't have any money, we can't do anything. Sorry, that's the end of the story. And what you've got in the US uh, has been the introduction of a whole range of legal techniques, which I won't go into now, uh, designed to uh, make it impossible for governments to raise more money. They lock in um, budget limits and as a result um, the situation is grim. The best way for you to see that for yourselves of course is simply to you can visit my current hometown of New York or you can go almost anywhere else in the US and you'll discover that the infrastructure is superb if your standards are 1960s or 1970s. Uh, compared to Melbourne, compared to any Western European country, it's like living in the third world. The roads, uh, the water systems, the sewerage systems, the rail systems, everything, it's absolutely grim because there is no money to spend on public infrastructure. But that's only the start. I'll give you a couple of examples and then move on. Education, uh, Oklahoma, but I could come up with a number of different states. Schools, high schools, are now open four days a week, not five. Teachers, who are in short supply, surprisingly, uh, have had their salaries frozen for the past 10 years, and they often earn less than full-time workers at Walmart. Now, Walmart is there because Walmart pays atrociously low wages. These teachers are getting less. And what you find is that a lot of them have second jobs in order to make it work. Emergency certifications are routinely given to enable unqualified persons to work as teachers. It's the only way they can get uh, the schools filled. Uh, even The Economist uh, wrote that deep tax cuts have wrecked the state's finances. Over the past decade, funding for education, primary and uh, high school, was cut by 28%. Then there's the area of criminal justice. And again, I think this is very relevant. Um, I'll mention several features very briefly. First, what they call fines and fees. This is a system that was highlighted by uh, the killing uh, of, a white, of a black man by a white police officer, very common in the United States, of course, um, in Ferguson, Missouri, caused riots, caused ongoing rebellion basically led the US Justice Department to do a big inquiry. They produced a report of hundreds of pages. What they described is the fact that in Ferguson there is no money in the public budget because there's no taxes. So the county officials talk to the cops and the judges and say you guys need to raise X amount of money uh, in the next three months because that's what we need, not to just to run the court system, but to run other parts of the city and county budget. And so what the cops did was to start arresting people, overwhelmingly black people, for very minor infractions. And of course, they can't pay. Then there are fees that are attached to the non-payment. And so the circle goes on. 
it's very common in the United States uh, today. Uh, you've got bail bonds. Uh, judges are imposing fairly significant amounts of bail, uh, even on poor defendants. The only way not to stay in jail, and therefore not to lose your job, not to lose your family, not to lose your house, is to borrow from a bail bond corporation, commercial operation. These um, corporations, now a $2 billion a year industry, um, require an immediate 10% uh, deposit. So in other words, if they have to lend you 50,000, you must immediately pay them 5,000 and that is not recoverable even if charges are dismissed the next day. But this is the system and they don't legislate against it. They continue to support the bail bond companies. Uh, risk assessments, uh, to determine uh, whether individuals should get bail are now largely undertaken by private corporations using algorithms, the details, the content of which are not disclosed because they are commercial uh, in confidence um, secrets and therefore the extent to which racist and other criteria are factored in, which is almost certainly the case. Uh, oh, you live in X suburb. Oh, you drive that car. Oh, you mix with these people. You're a high risk. Uh, you're not going to be let out on bail. Probation is privatized. Uh, when you're put on probation, you'll never see a, a state official again. You simply go and report to the Tobin Probation Company, which is down the road. Mr. Tobin is going to say to you, it's going to cost you X number of dollars per week for our services. Uh, if you don't pay, the probation company can actually have you put in prison. An automatic custodial sentence, all privatized. Um, let me uh, not go into any more details, but simply to say uh, that what struck me in the United States is that the tax revolution and the sort of rhetoric, which I believe we are seeing a lot of today in Australia, is all about shrinking the size of the state reducing the sort of services that are available and forcing uh, individual citizens either onto the street or leaving them at the mercy of the private sector, even in relation to the most central functions of most governments. And so when the rhetoric is we need to return the money to those who rightfully own it. We need to bring about these massive tax cuts. That's lovely in theory, but what it is saying is that the sort of community that you have that these American states once had is going to, in time, resemble the American. Because if governments have no money and they raise their money through taxation, then they are simply unable to provide services like infrastructure, services like uh, social protection for the poor, basic criminal justice uh, systems, and so on. And I think it's very important for us to make sure that that debate is held in Australia and that the example of the United States and where it's gone with its magnificent um, elimination of tax revenues um, is really one of the issues that we need to, to look at. Um, I would add just two other dimensions and then I'll finish. Um, I think there is a, I'm sorry for being uh, controversial here, but um, I think it's important to uh, raise these issues. Um, there's a, an interesting similarity, in my view, between the 
anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, of the Trump administration uh, and the role played by asylum seekers in the Australian debate. Um, the asylum seeker debate also reminds me in interesting ways of the death penalty debate in the United States. The death penalty debate, and this will offend anyone who is a supporter of Amnesty International, um, is a complete phony debate for the most part. The number of people executed in the United States now is derisory. It's dozens maximum in any given year. It's not a big issue in humanitarian terms. But it's an absolutely central part of the culture wars. You're either for the death penalty and against crime, or you are against the death penalty and therefore paying no attention to all of the victims, to the terrible crime problems that society is not actually having because crime has dropped dramatically in the United States in recent years, as you probably know. Um, but the death penalty debate is clung to by conservatives because it provides a completely artificial focus. And I think if you look at the number of asylum seekers, certainly compared to the immense costs that governments, successive governments in Australia have gone to in order to try to dispose of this problem. Um, it is again, it's a cultural uh, and ideological construct which uh, the significance of which has nothing to do with asylum seekers but much more to do with mobilization which then I think in due course will easily be turned on to the poor. Uh, to the, so it's, if we have no empathy for, no compassion for asylum seekers, it fits very nicely with the lack of compassion for those who are down and out, those who need social protection. But instead, Australia is busily, again, just as in the United States, imposing ever more penalties on those who are seeking public assistance, um, portraying them as drug and alcohol abusers, um, applying um, very uh, tough standards, which then lead to the elimination of all assistance and so on. And I think that it's part of a broader trend which makes it possible to say, look, we can't afford a welfare state, particularly now that we've had all these tax cuts. Uh, public revenue is very limited and it should go only to people who are able to make it on their own. Uh, the rest simply have to um, find uh, assistance elsewhere. The way forward, I think uh, one of the problems in Australia and in the United States is actually um, a reluctance to use human rights language. Human rights has become a problematic discourse in Australia in many contexts. Uh, certainly conservatives are making it so. There was an article in the Australian last week. Always love reading the Australian. It's like, uh, like Fox News in print. Um, no, no, it really is. It's just, it's, it's a propaganda rag um, worthy of its uh, owner. Um, so the three liberal members of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights are calling for its abolition, arguing that it elevates the rights of deadbeat dads and child sex offenders while failing to consider the safety of the community and is a bureaucratic waste of time. Now, I don't have time to go into the arguments that are given, but they are so specious uh, as to be absolutely laughable. But what's interesting is that this assault on the, the only uh, really miserable um, human rights uh, organ of the government, leaving out the Human Rights Commission, um, is 
symptomatic, I think, of the extent to which conservatives would like to eliminate any external value reference points. Um, in other words, it all comes down to what the majority wants and the rights of individuals, which are always trampled on at a certain point by governments around the world. That's the nature of government. It's no surprise. It's no shock. Uh, it's normal. Um, but if we simply reject human rights language and say, no, the majority, the parliament will uh, determine what standards are applicable, you very quickly find that significant portions of the population are going to have their rights uh, denied to them. Ironically, what I see is the increasing use by conservatives of rights language. So in the United States, they talk endlessly now about the right to dignity and the right to work. And that's what people who currently want welfare should be given. The right to dignity, which means no welfare, doesn't mean anything else. Uh, living in the street is fine. Having no health care, no teeth, that's all fine. But you have the dignity of not being on welfare and the right to work. Get outside, you bastard, and work. Um, that sort of rights language is very common and it's not being countered by an emphasis on alternative understandings of rights. Finally, I, I read a book um, a couple of days ago called Reimagining Australia by a man named Hugh Mackay, who seems to have written a lot of books, but I haven't read any of them in the past, so I don't know much about him. Uh, but it was, I think, a very profound book all about the key value of compassion. And I think that's the key element that is missing in all of these debates. The United States was founded on this notion of freedom from government. That's what the revolt against the British was. That's what is in the American psyche. We want nothing to do with government. We are all on our own. And so the individual with his or her shotgun and handgun and God knows what other gun is the ideal. They are on their own. They're taking care of their own security and they don't need any society around them. I think what Australia has always had in terms of whether it's mateship or uh, camaraderie or whatever is this element of solidarity, this element of community this element of compassion for the other. But once government is taken out of the picture, once there is no provision of public goods, once you see, as you do in other countries, the selling of public parks in order to raise money, uh, the selling of all public housing, the uh, disabling of government to really do anything for the public good, you will start to see the rapid erosion of the sort of spirit that certainly has made Australia. And the final word I want to say, uh, tell me I'm scaremongering, maybe I am. If you look around the world today, if you visit the sort of countries that I'm visiting, and if you see the speed and the ease with which established social orders are being overturned, you should think to yourselves, it's not impossible that it could happen here. People in the United States are deeply worried about whether or not the democracy of which they were once so proud will survive what is going on. And I don't only mean the gentleman with the orange hair. Uh, I mean all of the things that go with it, the throwing out of a great many social conventions that were so critical to holding the society together, the complete absence of government as a force for the public good, the abandonment to the private sector, uh, of any provisions of these so-called public goods. 
these things have the capacity to very rapidly undermine what holds societies together. And I think Australians need to think that despite how apparently healthy the political system is, that the sort of changes that are underway now in terms of tax policy and in terms of social policy have significant potential to radically change the nature of Australian society and to make us all much more vulnerable uh, to dramatic changes that none of us would want. Thank you. So it's 10 past uh, 5, just after 7 o'clock. Um, perhaps 10 minutes of questions, if that's okay with you, Philip, as well. So um, we've got roving microphones. If you could just please be brief, state your name and affiliation, and restrict it to questions rather than comments, please, given the hour of the day. So hands up, and I'll try and... Grab some volunteers. Up the back. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'll just add up. So I'm from Werribee, and Werribee has recently found out to be the highest uh, area with the recipients of set off Centrelink recipients. And uh, the, so the federal government decided to respond to that by tackling down on fraudsters. Uh, the shame was that most of the people in Werribee that were interviewed by Current Affairs were really for it. They said, um, you know, anything along the lines of, yeah, people should work. I want to know what you think about these sorts of trends in terms of the federal police really getting involved in, you know, tackling down on fraud and where that sh is. Maybe if you know any sort of prevalence, uh, prevalence in the United States. Um, I, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, I have no sympathy for people who are fraudulently getting welfare. Um, I know in the United States, for example, I think it was the Long Island Railroad, where it was revealed at a certain point, to the great glee of the tabloids, uh, that a huge percentage of its staff were on disability allowances. And of course it was revealed that there was a friendly doctor and once you hit 50, 52 or whatever, you went along to see Dr. Fred and he gave you a certificate saying that you were disabled and you were on a disability pension for life. And I and others reading that thought, you know, what a bloody outrage. Um, terrible uh, service on the Long Island Railway anyway. Um, rapidly losing money and this is one of the causes. But no sympathy at all. There's a thing that Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House in the US, used to talk about, which is evidence-based decision-making. What's the evidence? What are the statistics? I haven't seen evidence. I'm sure you could find from any number of government ministers strong statements about the large number of fraudsters in Werribee and elsewhere. But give us the statistics, please. We need to know how real a problem this is and what you're doing about it. But in fact, it's being, usually, it's being beaten up, uh, fluffed up, for other reasons. There are alternative uh, motivations going on. Uh, I'm all in favour of cracking down on welfare fraud, but it's not anywhere near as big an issue uh, as is presented. Other questions? Yeah. Jackie Fristacki, I'm a councillor in a local government, City of Yarra, and we're... Just take a microphone, Jackie Fristacki, councillor in the City of Yarra, and we're uh, uh, a council that takes pride in uh, supporting human rights and uh, refugees, as you'll see for our banners on our town, town halls. My question relates to... You've made us all very depressed uh, uh, in, in terms of... Um, the stuff that revolutions are made of in the United States. I mean, you know, the, the situation you've described is is uh, far worse than anything I have envisaged uh, could occur. But it is the stuff that revolutions are made of. And my question raises up: Is is there some debate that if if this continues, that the unrest gets to the stage that? Uh, you do have uh, revolution. I mean, you know, if anyone who's studied history, uh, 
this is these are characteristics of um, developing uh, and intense in unrest which can topple regimes. So just, and is is there a counter movement? How much is there a counter movement which you haven't described? Um, uh, I mean, one of the uh, one of the characteristics is, of course, denial on the part of the administration. Uh, Nikki Haley, uh, the ambassador to the UN, uh, said that my report was a disgrace, uh, that it was false, uh, and that I should actually be looking at Burundi and the Democratic Republic of the Congo because in the US there were really no serious problems. Uh, fortunately, a bunch of senators, uh, led by Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and other predictable characters, came out and said that if Nikki didn't think 40 million people living in poverty was a problem, uh, she should take another look. There was then a document leaked about a week ago um, to, first of all, foreign policy and then repeated in the Washington Post. And the document was the draft of the official State Department response to my report. And on the draft, various experts within the government had written, but you can't say this, it's just not true. Uh, well, these statistics are false. There was not a single change made in the draft that was put out or the final version that was put out. And that final version said, no, 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 you've got the poverty statistics all wrong. At most, there are a few hundred thousand people in the United States living in poverty because you've used the wrong figures. The only problem is that the figures I used are the official US Census Bureau figures, um, which no one else has ever previously contested in that way. Is there a potential for revolt? Um, I think one of the biggest problems in the United States is the media. Uh, which is, uh, has for a long time been dominated by our friend and compatriot. Um, and that means that uh, the majority of people are fed a steady diet of lies and misrepresentations uh, in relation to these sorts of issues. Um, so what's really happening is just cynicism. And I think that's the bigger risk in many of our societies. People do what they've done in Italy. I don't trust any of these bastards, so I'm going to vote for the clown from the Cinque Stelle movement. Um, and I think that's the risk. You'll see that the electoral system, including in a place like Australia, starts going haywire because the citizenry no longer think there is any viable alternative that is going to resist these sort of trends. But I don't see the likelihood in the USA. Yes, uh, yes, but that just means that you vote for the idiot um, rather than the uh, untrustworthy representative of a major party. Hi. Um, I'll just open my question with something I read on the weekend in the Sydney Morning Herald, or it may have been the Australian, and it was an article touching on homelessness, and it spoke about the state government spending $1 billion on homelessness services. Now, in that context, I just want to um, observe that what you've spoken about today is what I've myself called the um, commodification of the poor. And I wonder if you share my concern that um, when I hear local councils and local government talking about um, collaboration towards a common purpose, cross-collaboration, partnerships with public and private, partnering together to deal with some of these issues and to provide these services, if we're not actually just eroding separation of powers and um, actually creating a like a vice-like grip, if you like, that private privatisation of the, the services that the poor need. So the, the, yeah, the two things, separation of powers and the commodification of the poor. Uh, I mean, I agree with your, what I take to be your thrust uh, very strongly. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, 
There is no reason. Uh, I'm all in favour of the private sector. They play a very important role. There's absolutely no reason to expect that the private sector would or could or should uh, behave anything like government. And it doesn't matter how, in relation to the provision of public services, it doesn't matter how many conditions you impose, it doesn't matter how many uh, regulatory oversight bodies and so on, it's not going to work because the private sector is in it to make a profit, as they should be. Um, in terms of accountability, it's a huge problem for the human rights area uh, because what's happening is that human rights is really only able to get a grip on what governments are doing. And to the extent that you're busily privatising all the parts of your economy, human rights is then sort of regulating this tiny little bit over here that remains in the hands of the state. And the rest of the economy and the social system even is in private hands. And we have very limited ability. Uh, corporations steadfastly resist the notion that they have human rights obligations. Uh, and I don't think that's going to change in the near future. So it's a real issue. Thanks. Very kind.